We are ready to rock and roll. So thank you for joining us today. And today I am joined by Joshua Mata, who's the CEO and co-founder of Coalition. Uh, myself, I'm Nick Santoris, CEO and founder of Curricula. Uh, we're a cybersecurity education company, so we love talking about things that help educate people about all of the latest and greatest threats that are approaching. And today's topic is going to be about cyber threat predictions for 2021 and beyond. So we are fortunate enough to have Joshua join us today. Uh, they deal with cybersecurity insurance and everything fun in between. So uh, thank you, Joshua, for joining us. Why don't we kick off today to uh, tell the audience a little bit more about yourself, your background, and what you guys are doing at Coalition. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. So I'm Joshua Mata. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Coalition. Uh, for those of, of you who aren't aware of us, we're one of the larger, um, one of the largest providers of cyber insurance in the United States and, and now more recently in Canada. Um, but of course, what separates us a bit from a traditional insurance provider is that we proactively work with our customers to help them prevent losses. Um, so we are just as much a cybersecurity company as we are an insurance firm. Um, although all the technology that we build is, is provided at no cost to our, our policyholders. Um, why? Because of course we have the financial incentive to help protect them. Um, another notable thing is we help our customers during a loss. So we operate one of the larger instant response uh, firms in the country, um, aptly called Coalition Instant Response, in which we help our policyholders recover operationally during a loss. Um, so uh, my, my background, I, I come from, uh, I guess I've taken the Renaissance approach to life. I started off as an entrepreneur, but uh, I was a software engineer at a young age, um, have worked uh, in the intelligence community for some period of time, the financial services, and more recently uh, in the technology world. I was on the founding team of a company called Cloudflare, which may well uh, be used by a lot of the folks in the audience. So I was I uh, helped build that business and, and then launched Coalition afterwards. Thanks for having me, Nick. Yeah. And for those who don't know about myself, I've, uh, we started Curriculum about six years ago. We're partnered with Coalition to be part of those free tools that their policyholders have. Um, I work for the federal regulator for our power grid in North America, an agency called NERC, and uh, worked in cybersecurity my whole career. So uh, we love talking about educating people and, and learning about do, new fun ways on how we can learn how to be better at uh, preventing all of this cyber stuff coming our way. So the reason we invited Joshua to, to talk today is to learn a little bit more about kind of what they see, right? They see a lot of stuff that's going on with different companies in different industries. So looking back on, on 2020, you know, what were some of the biggest themes, I guess, that you guys have seen and the claims and stuff that's been happening um, across your customer base? Yeah. Like, look. Um... I th last year we've handled whew, probably about, like over a thousand different claims. And I'd say the one clear theme is that not much has changed. Uh, the same things that have been causing organizations strife or losses for the past uh, several years, they're still here today, right? So uh, email is overwhelmingly the number one entry point into a company's network. That's oftentimes where the bad things start. Um, remote access points, you know, are probably a, a close but trailing number two. Um, and, and again, these are all things that I think we've been aware of for a while, but uh, it's, it's still the basics. Um, and ultimately, it, it comes down to, you know, human error of one, in one way, shape or form. Yeah, it's interesting um, that you bring that up. So nothing's new, it sounds like. We're still seeing a lot of the same old, same old. Uh, phishing, clearly still an advantage for the bad guys. Human error is an interesting subject because, you know, there's definitions of, of what that means, right? Um, yeah. Back at NERC, I used to play on a role that uh, analyzed what human error actually meant, right? So we'd look at an event on the power grid and try to work ourselves backwards to see what really caused that human error. And there was cause coding and all kinds of cool things that were taken from the FAA to figure out, you know, how do we apply this to that? Are you guys kind of looking at that same thing of like, hey, when we see human error, there's kind of a, a multitude of things that lead to these types of events? Oh, absolutely. I mean, and you know, it, it, it's it, in some way, shape, or form, like human error is involved in almost every single claim we have. Now, it's not always intentional. Um, sometimes it's accidental. Sometimes the human error wasn't actually on the part of our policyholder. It could have been a third party um, that ultimately resulted in a loss for for the companies that we insure. 
But uh, we are looking to code all of these things, right? And gather data on what's happening. And so to your point, like as from, a, from a cyber insurance perspective, the most common claims were perhaps unsurprisingly ransomware claims. Um, you know, those have grown substantially in both frequency and severity, um, and particularly on the severity side. You know, those claims used to cost maybe $10,000. Now it's not uncommon to see them cost multi-million dollars. Um, funds transfer fraud and social engineering, that's another large one. Uh, and it's almost entirely human error in some way, shape or form. Either someone in the organization was tricked into wiring funds or even more common, a third party, a partner, a vendor, you know, someone there was tricked and uh, there was a business email compromise and that business email compromise was then used to defraud our policyholder. Um, so even though I guess there's technically human error there, there's really nothing our, our customers could have done. Um, and then, you know, the other one are just general costs around recovering from a, from a breach. Um, so we call those breach response costs. That was a, so those three things, the ransomware, so paying the extortions, breach response costs, and sort of that social engineering funds transfer fraud, those are the three largest claims that we've seen in both 2019 and uh, thus far in the 2020 policy year. Yeah, no, it's, um, it's good to know, right? If, if we hear about ransomware and we see it in the news every single day, it's like, this is happening, whether it's in or out of the news to companies of all shapes and sizes. So you guys see quite a bit of it. So it's something for everyone to be, be aware of. So back at, uh, we did Curriculaville, uh, it was a couple of weeks ago, a month ago, something like that. And we talked a little bit about the future of cybersecurity and really that it's not just on the technology problem, it's a risk management problem. And you know, I know we can talk all day and you love risk management, that's your whole business there. <laughs> um, what can yeah. What can you dig into or share with us about kind of like what a business can approach and how the attendees of this webinar can approach kind of risk management for their organizations? Yeah, I mean, look, it, it took me, you know, I, I joke that coalition, you know, the idea came to us overnight, but it was after thinking about it for 25 years. And, you know, historically, I very much took a technology approach to this problem. I mean, worked at Cloudflare, was uh, worked in the federal government. And, and I think one of the epiphanies was that, hey, this isn't exclusively a technology problem. Um, it's really a risk management problem, right? And if you think about it in that way, as an organization, there's really three things that you can do. You can accept the risk and uh, you can do that knowingly. Ideally, that's the right way to do it. But sadly, when it comes to cyber risk, technological risk, many organizations are accepting it unknowingly, right? They're adopting all these new technologies. They're collecting data in new ways. Um, they get all the benefits, the productivity benefits, so on and so forth, but um, they're kind of ignoring the risks that come along with it, or, or at least not aware of it. So there's, there's risk acceptance, there's risk mitigation, in which, of course, technology can play an excellent role, training staff, hiring staff, so on and so forth, um, implementing basic controls and protective actions in your company. Um, so even things like, for example, this, these wire fraud, you know, if you have a simple process where you just use an out-of-band method to confirm a, a new wire instruction, it's really old school, but it's very effective at preventing, you know, a, a wire going out to to a criminal. So these are all things that can reduce your risk. But I think historically, this was viewed as sort of a linear line, a linear reduction of risk to zero, where it's like, hey, if we just check all these things, if we do the NIST framework, if we do whatever, then we're secure. Um, Security is an illusion, uh, is sort of the way I've always thought about it. And I think the curve isn't a linear line to zero, it's really a diminishing returns curve. Meaning, yes, you should do all the things, uh, security awareness training, you should have antivirus, you should do these things, but you have to be aware that every investment you make buys you a marginal amount, uh, a, a lesser and lesser amount of uh, risk reduction. And at some point you could do literally everything and there's still some amount of tail risk, right? Like something bad could still happen. You know, we've managed to eliminate every other form of crime, but sadly I don't, or we haven't managed, I should say, to eliminate any other form of crime. And I don't think cyber crime is going to be the first. So that's where it then comes to the third uh, uh, risk management strategy, which is transfer. And so it's a, sort of a fancy way of saying, you can't eliminate cyber risk, uh, technological risk, but you can eliminate the cost of it by transferring it to a third party. And so what we're advocates of is, is really helping companies think about it in that way, um, helping them make informed decisions on how they mitigate their risk. And then of course, having that risk transfer insurance in place to where if the worst does come to pass, 
um, they have the means to financially recover. They're not all accepting it. Yeah. Um, it's funny, it's kind of the utility of security investments, right? At a certain point, you lose utility coming from an economics world, uh, no different on some of the controls that we're putting in place there. So that's an interesting yeah. topic. So, you know, talking about the, the investments made and, and kind of uh, the approaches for risk management, a lot of organization, I'm sure a ton of people on this call have to deal with some sort of compliance in their organization. Uh, right. I watch it happen all the time. Right from an, a compliance auditor's approach, our goal was to you know find compliance violations and find you know that people are saying what they're saying and doing what they're doing, and then right. ultimately when compliance controls come in and some people have been doing compliance for a while or organizations are adopting compliance for the first time, going through an audit or something like that, um, you kind of lose sight of the security behind why you're doing compliance. So. I don't know if you know this, but like, I guess out of the, the people that are focused on compliance investments, um, have you seen that alignment with security or at least some type of correlation of uh, compliance misleading people or, you know, what's your opinion on that whole approach? <laughs> yeah, I mean, compliance and security are certainly two very different things. Um, and, you know, of course, I'd love to believe that the frameworks that are being pushed upon are recommending controls where there is actual evidence that that control is reducing risk. So I think compliance ultimately does need to, even though they're different things, they need to be tied into one another. And I think the two things is, uh, brought together as well really encourage more of that risk-based approach, right? Because compliance in, in many respects is not just about the raw, like checking the box, you know, we've done these things. It's really designed to try and think about how do we how do we implement controls? How do we think about this from a risk uh, a risk based approach? Um, but interestingly enough, uh, a lot of the compliance frameworks don't take it the full length. They don't actually require you know the, the, an organization to truly think about it in the in that framework I've just mentioned, right? Like very few compliance frameworks that I'm aware of, you know, even mention risk transfer whatsoever. It's it's all focused around um, mitigation. Yeah. And it's, you know, I think it's tough because when you have all this weight on your shoulders and you're trying to do all the compliance stuff, uh, sometimes it has the opposite effect and you're, you know, you're doing things that are not great for security for sake of compliance, which is sad, but true, I think, in, in what we see. And from, from what I used to work with, it's, it's the, a, gr a great compliance program always focuses on kind of the identify, assess, correct model. And it's yeah. always there to help find risk and mitigate it and then hope it doesn't happen because you've built controls around it. Um, but unfortunately, I think a lot of these organizations that are put into compliance, no one wants to make a mistake, right? Because you make a mistake, now you gotta tell people about it. And now it becomes part of this thing that could hurt you as an individual or a company. Um, so it's interesting right. to hear how that's gonna evolve over the next few years. Oh, absolutely. And it's, I mean, and it's gonna go far beyond IT as well, right? I mean, I think more of the recent compliance frameworks ranging from GDPR, CCPA, the California Consumer Privacy Act. It's now about your core business operations. How are you collecting data? From who? For what purpose? Um, you know, did you have the consent? How are you using it? Uh, many of these, these new uh, frameworks now require that you actually comply with your stated policies. So it's not just enough to have a privacy policy. You now actually need to follow it. Um, and if you don't, you can be sanctioned, even if you haven't suffered a breach, and even if there hasn't been a privacy violation of any sort. So um, it's definitely broadening, broadening the aperture of, of what an organization has to think about, right? Like, again, this isn't just some, it's no longer can be siloed in, in the IT organization. Um, there has to be an organization-wide approach to thinking about security and compliance together. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny, um, speaking of compliance and GDPR, uh, if we all remember back, uh, was a couple of years ago when everyone was going panicking and sending out GDPR consent notices to every person, it's like the ripest picking for phishing attacks because they were literally sending cold emails out to say, please click and consent to these things. So uh, clearly we made some templates to help people educate on why that isn't the greatest thing to do unannounced. Yeah, ironic, huh? Yeah, so, so when you think about that, right, another one of those compliance without thinking of security stuff, but um, guiding off of that principle, you have, you know, people and process and technology inside of this equation and that people are making 
you know, uh, making decisions and errors based off some of the things that we put in place. So uh, on the technology component of, of compliance and all of these other tools, how, yeah. how can businesses kind of understand how, uh, I guess, dependent they are on some of these technologies for whether it's compliance, security, or just their day-to-day -day business operation? Yeah, I mean, in terms of like, how can they quantify the, the risk to them? Is that sort of yeah, what you're a asking? Bit. Yeah, like, I guess they just kind of depend on it and don't really know what it could lead to or not lead to. on the Well, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, you know, yeah, it's hard to think of a single for-profit, not-for-profit, or even religious institution um, in this country that isn't dependent on a working computer and internet connection and access to data either locally on the computer or through the internet connection. And, you know, most businesses don't truly realize how dependent they are on it until it's removed. Um, you know, like a, a ransomware attack against a small business can be devastating. And it's only at that moment that they realized how dependent they are on <laughs> everything working um, as intended. Uh, so, you know, in terms of how do, how do we quantify that? Um, you know, we try and gather data at a fairly significant scale we, which we gain glean by underwriting accounts, right? We're we're under, we're trying to look at the controls and the protective actions that organizations have implemented, or not, um, as the case may be, as well as the technologies that they're using, and we correlate those with claims um, and losses. And so we're kind of in this unique position, I you know front row seats with the popcorn, where we get to correlate these two things. And so in all of the losses that, that we've had, I mean, it's become abundantly clear that there are a handful of controls that are more effective than others, right? And so, you know, if you go back to where we started this, like, hey, email is overwhelmingly an entry point um, into a company's network. Well, then it stands to reason that controls around email are gonna have the biggest bang for the buck. At least that's what we see across, you know, the, the scale at which we operate. So that could be things like enabling two-factor authentication, you know, if that had been done, we'd probably have half the number of insurance claims that we have. Not to say that it's foolproof or that it can't be defeated. That's, uh, it certainly can, but it adds enough friction, particularly for attacks that are happening at scale, um, that it's it's more than likely going to going to stop it cold in the tracks. I mean, even basic things like emailing S, uh, or configuring SPF records or DMARC records, making it slightly harder to impersonate or spoof you know, on the margin can help. Uh, so, so there's just basic uh, controls that we've seen. Those are certain technologies that we find to be more correlated with losses. So for example, if you're using Microsoft remote desktop protocol or any form of remote desktop protocol, and it doesn't matter if it's on the standard port, you know, 3389, or you've been clever and moved it to a non-standard port, you know, hackers are scanning the internet, looking for that on every single port. And if they find it, like that's the nail that's sticking out, right? And they've got the hammer. So we see small businesses being targeted just because they've decided to expose that surface uh, on the internet and for no other reason. So there's certain things that are like very highly correlated. We then try and take all that data and turn it into dollars and cents. Um, so we're actually able to model out the, free, the likely, uh, the expected frequency of a loss and how much more likely an organization is likely to suffer a loss versus the average. We can also model out the exceedance probability of loss curve to tell people that, hey, if something bad does happen, this is likely what it's going to cost. Um, this is the median, this is the one in 10 year loss, this is the one in 100 year loss. So it's really trying to turn this security data into dollars and cents. It's, uh, yeah, it's interesting for everyone listening, you know, you're, you're trying to, if, if you're thinking about these things, right, clearly there's a lot of math and, and other uh, calculations going into your models here, but, you know, uh, some of the things that you mentioned are the basics, and it's things that you probably could have stopped a majority of this if you just turned on 2FA on, on these accounts at, at your business. We all know at, at home, we should be doing that stuff as well. So I guess the, the, my recommendation of just kind of understanding this model. If if I were uh, someone sitting in this webinar and I haven't simulated one of these events or thought about, hey, uh, do we have anyone that doesn't have 2FA turned on on their email account? Think about how quickly bad things could happen in your company. Now expand that to all the apps and services being used in your company and think of the the profile of how much bigger your scope gets because of all the other software and applications you're using. One of the ways that we help 
educate people is by simulating a, an attack, a phishing attack, right? It's pretty straightforward when you can launch a, a button, see the thing go out live, watch a dashboard and see who fell for it. And then you can start to calculate that little math equation inside your own company on what would be the event that would lead to that. What other, so other than simulating clearly with a phishing uh, tool with us, turning on 2FA, what are some of those basics? What are some things that uh, businesses or IT teams can do to kind of uh, figure out, you know, what, what this would look like for them? Yeah, you know, so I, I think, you know, one, maybe not mistake I, I, I see happen, but maybe just a change in mentality that I would advocate for is that, you know, the breach is not the point of failure. Um, companies are going to get breached, right? Like bad things are going to happen to good companies despite a lot of the things that they're doing. And, and you know, things like 2FA, like you mentioned, you know, encouraging password managers to prevent credential stuffing attacks, you know, not enabling remote access to your network and exposing it on the public internet. Like these are, these are all things that you can do to reduce the likelihood that a criminal targets you in the first place or that they're successful. But if they are, you know, it's things like backing up your data in doing so, in a, in a segmented uh, area, right? So it's an, some sort of remote offsite backup, making sure that you're regularly testing those backups. Um, I can't tell you the number of times we see things happen where you know, the backups got encrypted along with everything else during the ransomware attack, or they hadn't, they, you know, the whole backup thing stopped and it's now a month old. They hadn't been doing it for the past you know, several weeks, or they'd never tested to see if they could restore them. And then they're having trouble with that. You know, that can be the difference between something that is quite devastating to a business and something that's just a, a really a nuisance. So, you know, I know I'm not saying anything that's uh, not probably already obvious and maybe I'm gonna be somewhat heretical, uh, make a heretical statement, but we're incredibly pragmatic about this. I, you know, we don't concern ourselves with compliance frameworks and whatnot. We're just trying to go to first principles. What are the things that lead to losses? Um, and almost invariably it is these basic things. Um, you know, the, I'd say the other thing to put in there is just patching. Again, not, not going to tell anyone anything new, but when we see web application attacks or, you know, uh, these other sorts of attacks, it, it almost is always exposing some sort of known vulnerability, right? Like the Pulse VPN vulnerability or uh, F5, right? We saw being actively targeted. Bluekeep, um, which was just a, another vulnerability in RDP. Um, things that we see criminals actively exploiting, uh, these are also things of concern. And that's where a big part of our service is as we learn about these things, and of course, paying a claim is the, is the most costly way to learn, we're understanding what those TTPs of the attackers are, right? And then we can use that and scan the rest of our policyholder base. So for example, when Bluekeep was announced back in uh, early 2019, within 24 hours, we'd scanned every single computer of all of our policyholders and found that 56 of them had blue keep exposed machines on the internet. And we went about working with them to try and patch them. So that's these kind of basic things um, uh, are, are really what we advocate. And, and it's not about achieving 100% security, right? I mean, any legitimate IT person is gonna go way beyond what, what we're advocating. What we're really focused on is preventing criminals from paying attention to a company. Like I know that all of my customers can be hacked. I mean, I worked at CIA and we had a 100% success rate penetrating networks. So if you spend enough time, you will get in. Um, for us, it's really about avoiding, uh, allowing our customers to avoid putting a target on their back. And so if we can just remove the most obvious things, no one's gonna pay attention to them, right? There's enough other vulnerable targets across the world that it's unlikely anyone's ever going to spend the time. Now that's not true if you're a corporation or your organization is a target of choice, right? If someone is deliberately, if there's a, a political or, or you know, other reason to target your organization, that's a whole different problem set. And, and that's, that's not as much of our, of our focus. Yeah, I, uh, I heard the other day, it was, um, we were laughing this morning, I guess it's nothing to laugh about, but it's like, why are you putting your employees in the position to be used as a punching bag by the bad guys? And it's like, because we're not focusing on some of these basic principles that are leading to the biggest claims, breaches, data, right? We're not talking about things that are um, seen in movies where it's like really complex, long overdue uh, scenarios. Like these are some basic principles that we need to 
to, to look at in our organizations. And sometimes we don't just take the moment to pause and look at that stuff and say, are we taking care of the basic things first before we start thinking of the most advanced things in our, in our company? Um, one of them being, you know, uh, for us, we always look at like the data, right? The simulating attacks and going through our training and stuff. That's all good, right? That's the front end of it. You learn about a story that could happen to you or you'd run a test and you get results. Well, what'd you learn from it? Did you learn yeah. that you had weaknesses? Did you learn that um, maybe we shouldn't do that anymore? Maybe we are uh, never educated our people about this topic and lessons learned and then making changes based off the lessons learned, I think is something that's highly overlooked across the entire industry. We're just focused on compliance and getting things done and numbers and numbers and numbers, but we're not making a change based off that. Oh, 100%. Yeah, I mean, and that's, that's certainly something we're looking to tackle as well. I mean, I'll give you a, a clear example. Our claims data actually revealed that if you used Microsoft 365, you were 3.2 times more likely to file a claim with us than if you use G Suite. Now, causation, co correlation, like it's, it's hard to exactly say why, but we're, we now have this data, like, and it's statistically significant. Um, I, I may have my hypotheses on why, but we can now start to have a conversation about that as an industry. And, and it's like, hey, are there certain configurations that aren't turned on as well? Is one just better at detecting phishing emails than the other? But it's things like this that we're ultimately incorporating into our pricing, um, into how we price the risk. And we're also exposing this to customers to let them know, hey, these are the decisions that we've seen you make. These are the ones that have, we believe have reduced your risk. And this is the reduction you get. These are the things that have increased it, um, some of which they can control and others of which they can't control. And you know, we don't ever advocate that someone switch. Like at the end of the day, you have to make technology decisions that meet your business. You have to design security around your business. Um, you have to design risk management around your business. And so that's something that, that's sort of the approach that we look to take with our clients. Yeah, that's a um, timely topic because I think it was a, a month ago or so, I was talking about this whole concept of process, people, technology. Like what, which chicken and egg, which comes first, right? And a lot of times we buy technology and then try to retrofit our people and process into it. And yeah. That doesn't always work out great, right? It's, it's uh, the way we kind of looked at it was establishing some understanding of a process. Like, why are we doing what we're doing? Putting our people into that process, trying to figure out. And then technology kind of comes along with it, right? Because technology will change over time. It's a guarantee that's going to happen. You know, you might use Microsoft one day, G Suite the other day. Uh, you might yeah. use one visitor control system one day, you change it the next day. Another patch management system one day, you change it the next month. Um, that's always going to change, but a lot of businesses aren't prepared for that. They, they rope so much into the technology that um, it keeps them stuck and it, it, it prevents them from doing things that should be done, but unfortunately they can't. Um, so any recommendations there on kind of getting the audience members and, peer, and, and people listening in to kind of understand like, how do I step back and look at that equation a little bit better? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's I, I, I'll, full disclosure, like I'm much, I have much more experience getting into networks versus defending them. So it's somewhat ironic that, uh, that I'm advising on how to defend them. And that's very much our approach. Like we look at anytime someone gets a quote of insurance from us, we're looking at them in the way that a real life sophisticated adversary would. And we're making a determination of how likely are they to be targeted. So, you know, the, the biggest things um, for me are, I don't, we have all sorts of customers who are using legacy software um, that are using legacy operating systems uh, that are using, you know, Windows 2008 and unsupported things. And, you know, probably for a variety of reasons, budget constraints and other priorities and this, this or that. You know, it, our biggest focus is keeping those things off of the internet. So anything that actually is touching the, you know, the internet, like you don't want to, you just don't want any nails exposed. Um, and if you can just remove, eliminate all those, the obvious nails, like unpatched computer systems, unpatched, you know, whatever uh, load balancers, firewalls, whatever the case may be, uh, remove remote, remote access points, then really what's left is, is email. Um, and, and so, you know, if you can guard that, that's, uh, that's important. But then otherwise, it's also just preparing that, hey, things can happen. Uh, things will happen. And are you prepared for it? 
And I think part of being prepared for it is having an ability to recover, um, you know, relatively quickly and as intact as you can. It's having an instant response plan or having someone that you can work with to do that. Uh, that's something that all cyber insurance providers offer. So they cover they cover breach response costs. They cover the cost to bring in, you know, a third party. Um, as I mentioned, we have we have that service ourselves, which makes us somewhat unique. So the second you call us, like there's someone on the other end of the line that can literally help you put out the fire inside of your network. Because sadly, like that's 911 isn't any good for that. Normally, if you're a business owner and you're victimized by crime, you know, whatever you call it or, or some other malady, you can call the fire department or the police department. But, but sadly, the fire department, you know, can't put out the virtual fire in your network. And I imagine the police showing up to be, you know, the next version of the Zoolander movie, right? It's like, the criminals are inside the computer. Their guns are drawn, you know, pointing them at your Windows box, and uh, it just doesn't just doesn't work like that, as we all know. So having having those resources in place to help you react is, I think, another way in which to think about it. Yeah, that it's funny. A, a story from back a few years ago. We were at a, a pretty large um, uh, startup that was growing really fast, and they had their lawyers in the room. And we we're talking about instant response, right? We were watching one of our episodes where a zoo gets hacked and everything's going crazy. So we were just talking about that with them. Like, hey, you got a lot of employees, people coming in left and right. Um, what would happen if uh, something super bad happened right now and the news started calling your organization to try to find out the details from it? And the lawyers are in the room and they go, well, that would be Michael's job. No, 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 Susie would do that. Like, don't, no way. Yeah. So they start arguing with each other. And these are the senior VP legal team inside this company. It's like, you got about 700 other people out there. What do you think they're going to do during this type yeah. of scenario? They're, they might talk to the news reporters. They might spill something. They might do something wrong. Um, so I guess I can't stress enough on kind of the advocating for going through a practice exercise. Like, who's your 911? To like, who, when something happens, what do you do? Who calls who? Has that been updated? I mean, uh, in the compliance world, they literally, in the NERC world at least, there's literally a regulation saying you have to have a plan behind this. And with that, they still wouldn't have it up to date. It would still be right. a mess. And that's a compliance federally regulated uh, standard on an industry. So imagine with no compliance, right? If you're sitting here listening to this and you do not have an understanding of who your uh, cyber 911 would be, start to think about that. Start to practice that scenario, at least in your head. And then you could start talking with your team about it and get a feel for how hard it might feel if you got hit. Yeah, well, and working with a third party, I mean, you know, it's, I think you have to do it. I mean, take, for example, the folks on our team, I mean, this is all we do every day. Like we've seen every strain of ransomware you can imagine. We've negotiated with every threat group you can imagine. Um, that's just not something that any single company can do. Uh, and I think that's, you know, frankly, as we've, Found of this. That's why we called the company coalition, right? Every single company is literally trying to fight this uh, risk or this scourge by themselves. And, you know, many are doing a great job, but we could do so much better if we pooled resources together. And that's kind of how we see the company. Like everyone kind of pays their insurance premiums, they chip in their bit. And fortunately, most of our customers don't have a claim in any given year, but, uh, but about one and a half percent of them do. Uh, which is, by the way, a fraction of the market average, where about 6.4% of companies who have cyber insurance will file a claim in a given year. It's actually, you are more likely to file a cyber insurance claim than a workers' compensation claim. And yet every company has to buy workers' compensation and very few buy cyber insurance. It just makes no sense. But um, you know, if we're able to provide those resources to businesses, um, those expert resources, that's where I think we can help fight this in a more effective way, in a, in a much more cost-effective way. Yeah. So speaking of cost effective and, and the bad guys, you know, yeah, ransomware, talking about you negotiating for people. I want to hear more about that. But, you know, what, yeah. how do we flip the script on this, on, the, on putting more costs, more barriers onto the bad guys, other than the basic controls we talked about? Um, what are some ideas? I guess you guys have negotiated and, and had that. That's kind of cool. So how, uh, yeah, here's some of that. That would be interesting. Yeah, I mean, so obviously from the perspective of an individual organization, well, everything, by the way, is it's about moving costs, right? Because ultimately this is an economics equation. Um, and I remember reading a, a paper about the Nigerian Prince email scam and how it was actually a mathematically rational attack strategy. 
and I'll just I'll spend a second on it because I think it illuminates this point, which is, you know, you get these emails and you're like, who's ever going to fall for this, right? Um, no one would ever like send money to whatever whatever prince over in Nigeria, but the attackers have very cost effectively separated literally the most gullible people on the planet um, from everyone else, and so now they can focus their resources on defrauding those folks. And of course, the cost to send spam is very low. Um, so they were actually able to make money by doing it. And the more ridiculous the email, it would actually help them better separate um, who is doing, you know, who is more gullible from, from the others. And so at the end of the day, it, it, it comes down to costs because of course an attacker, they have to invest time, resources. You know, I've not, I've not seen AI that is able to pull off like full on cyber crime from soup to nuts. Um, you know, without any human intervention. And so it's like, how do we make things more expensive? Things like we've talked about 2FA, whatnot, these things just make life more expensive. Um, what can we do though more broadly? This is kind of what we're focused on as frankly a coalition. You know, one of the things we've done is we've started to build a team of people, many who came out of the National Security Agency. We're all, we have a, a portion of our security team that is just dedicated to infiltrating criminal infrastructure. Um, and we now have visibility into the C2 of a lot of these actors, dry decks, um, so on and so forth. And we can now tell if, hey, if one of our customers' computers is communicating with this infrastructure, we know that there's something bad inside their network, right? There's an emotet or trick bot infection. And we're now in a position where we can tell our customer, hey, you have a malware infection. It's this user, it's this host name, even though we're not in their network, right? Like we're able to see that. And that's just a capability set that no most individual companies, maybe with the exception of some of the largest, would never be able to build themselves. But we're building it for all 30,000 businesses that we work with, right? So we're looking to bring like highly, highly sophisticated threat intelligence techniques and whatnot to the masses, make it easy to consume, make it free, um, you know, beyond, we don't charge for this beyond just purchasing an insurance policy. And we're not doing it because we're Mother Teresa. We're doing it because we have a financial interest. If our customers do have a loss, we have to pay for it. And so naturally, it's in our interest to contain those. So I think that there's things that we can do as an industry. I think the insurance industry has a role to play. I mean, I'd even love it one day. Um, I was on the phone with a, one of the past attorney generals of the US, and I jokingly asked him for a license to kill or an order of mark or whatever they call it. Mm -hmm. Because at some point, I'd love to offensively go after the bad guys. Um, you know, any individual company, not going to have the resources or the, or the wherewithal to do it. But if we have one threat actor that is resulting in tens of millions of dollars of losses across all the companies we insure, we have a significant financial incentive to try and shut that actor down. And so, um, you know, hacking back would be the fun way to do it, but there's even legal ways. And so we're even, we're even starting to uh, enact civil proceedings against actors. So we can file John Doe lawsuits against IP addresses. We can use the powers of discovery to try and unravel the criminal infrastructure. And we're actively working to shut it down, which is just another way of increasing costs. So um, lots more to do there, but I think uh, there, you know, there's, uh, there's a whole number of ways, but you got it right. We have to push the cost back on the actor and it's not an easy thing to do. Yeah, no, I, super cool stuff. I mean, uh, it, you look at this, right, and it's modernizing the community, I think, is something that is uh, far overlooked in cyber, right? Everyone's playing their own defense in their own castle by themselves without talking to anyone. And, you know, if you're from a critical infrastructure, there's um, uh, these agencies called ISATs, which are information yeah. and analysis centers, which are great because it's a way to get the community involved a little bit more. Um, but that doesn't work for everyone, right? So if you think of the small business, right? The uh, how you know how do you build around a community of people just like you? And there's forums and things like that, and it's kind of like ad hoc way of, of approaching this. But um, and this goes beyond just buying products, right? This isn't just about like I buy a product because I think they're cool or whatever it is. Like this is more about these are things we're seeing. What are you seeing? Let's work together to defend against this in a future, maybe uh, playing offense. But uh, yeah, I think we're, we're probably pretty far away from that until we start establishing these communities. But um, 
I can't advocate for that enough. We talked about it during curricula bill that community needs to be more, right? There needs to be more happening, just not just between government agencies and like critical infrastructures, right? We need to spread that type of model amongst small and mid-sized businesses with each other and with other groups that can help them not battling this alone. That's right. That's absolutely right. And yeah, I mean, for, from our perspective, I think you'll see us publishing a lot more data um, in this regard, publishing claims data, helping organizations understand the trade-offs. Uh, we even have a number of new features, like risk assessments that we give companies that are actually grounded in claims data and they're all free of charge. So if anyone who's listening was interested in one um, would be happy to follow up with you afterwards and, and, and get you one. And it's, and it's literally grounded in all of the loss data that we've had for the past three years that we've been writing insurance. Um, a big part of our mission is to solve cyber risk. And for us, that doesn't mean solving cybersecurity failures, like things are gonna happen. It means helping companies survive them. And a big part about that is democratizing access to cybersecurity because it's so expensive, right? It's, it's not only costly to buy, um, but it's just costly to understand and to learn and to, and, you know, to continuously be educated, particularly because most IT teams are more focused on just business operations, like growing the company, you know, not to say that security is an afterthought, but it, oftentimes it, it just has to be. Um, it's not the number one priority. So our focus is how do, we, how do we decrease that cost? How do we provide this data for free? How do we make it easy to consume and use? Um, so uh, stay tuned, more, more, more to come. Yeah. So yeah, community is pretty big. So, you know, we talk about kind of the future, right? All this stuff that we've heard is all leading towards like, well, hopefully after listening to some of this stuff, you might go back and do some uh, exercises of your own, right? Checking it to a phase on, um, yeah. checking some of the accounts, knowing which accounts that your company's using, I think is just an inventory is probably something that's far overlooked in the security field. So knowing that ransomware is big, right? Yeah. And that's something that's gonna most likely be, be pretty big because the barrier to entry is pretty low. Um, it's gonna get much worse. That yeah, would be my 2021 prediction. <laughs> the, the, so yeah, so the 2021 moving forward, if we can't predict the future, we still feel that ransomware is going to lead the charge for coming into next year. Yeah, so I mean, what's so interesting about ransomware, like it's a business model innovation more than it is a technical innovation, right? And I actually think it's the most disruptive thing that's happened in cybersecurity since I've you know, been conscious or alive, <laughs> um, frankly, and it's continuing to involve, uh, continuing to involve, I should say. Um, so, you know, historically it was focused on just locking up people's data, right? And that was enough, get them to pay a ransom. They've obviously gotten great at not just locking one machine, but locking all machines, deliberately locking backups. Everything is about increasing their leverage. And I think one of the big trends for 2021 is you're going to see them get a lot more creative in how they do that. And it's going to be tailored to the organization. So you really have to think, um, you know, if you're the IT person or risk manager, like, what horrible things could a bad actor do if they had access to my, if they controlled my computer systems or my data? And so some of the things we've started to see them do range from not just locking your data, but they exfiltrate and take a copy of it. And now you have to pay the ransom both to get the data back and to prevent them from publishing it on the internet. So if you actually value, you don't want that to become public knowledge, now they have more leverage. We've seen them for with uh, doctor's offices and healthcare providers they're now not just extorting the organization they stole the data from, they're extorting the patients. If you don't want your patient record published, then pay us money. Um, it's devastating. I, and I have a prediction for 2021, particularly for organizations that have industrial control systems or things of the like, you're going to see them literally holding organizations hostage over things like causing property damage or even bodily injury, right? It's like, if you don't pay us, we're going to you know, shut down this chemical refrigeration system, or we're going to you know, turn off some sort of uh, equipment to, you know, at a hospital um, or, or the like. I mean, it's only going to get worse and criminals are getting much more clever at how they can gain leverage over the victims. Because it, it, again, it goes back to that cost equation. If they're gonna invest their time in doing it, they want to have you know, a, a, a high probability of getting what they're after, which is that extortion payment. And of course, now that organizations are more aware of ransomware, now that they're backing up, they're keeping these things segmented, all the things we've been recommending, it's getting harder and harder for them. That percentage has been going down. So they're finding 
little modifications of the business plan to, uh, to, to really grab hold of those victims. So I think it's, it's only going to become more devastating. And as their leverage goes up, it also means the cost to the organization is going to go up, right? It's the more money that they can demand. So we're no longer, you know, we're no longer seeing, it's pretty rare to see even a hundred thousand dollar ransom uh, demand. You know, oftentimes it's multiple hundreds of thousands, millions for larger organizations. Uh, even just a, I saw $2 billion corporation, which was not our customer, fortunately, uh, about a month ago that there was a hundred million dollar demand um, following a ransomware attack. So it's, um, it can be quite devastating. Yeah, um, to the point of uh, making major structural changes in an organization if something like that were to go down. So uh, here's a topic that I guess is, I'm interested to see what your uh, insight is on this one is throughout this year, um, in a matter of days, if not weeks, the entire world changed from a technology point of view, right? Things that existed inside of uh, what we call an organization were kind of very structured. And a lot of these organizations, in a matter of days, literally sent people home and asked them to operate remotely now for months and months and months and months. Uh, we'll yeah. probably still see that. Hopefully, vaccine comes pretty soon and we can start somewhat changing our behaviors. But I think this opened up a new, um, it opened a lot of eyes for different types of organizations. The big organizations that said, we'll never do remote working, were forced to do it. The small ones that were trying to get into a physical office are now embracing like, yeah, this is great. We don't need to have an office. But the concern is remoteness now creates a, uh, a larger scope of profile for these exposed employees and devices and networks and everything in between. I'd love to hear your thoughts on kind of how you think that's going to affect uh, not only the insurance side, but um, just the, the cyber side of dealing with this. Yeah, no, I mean, I've told people, look, we're more dependent on technology today than we ever have been in human history. And I'd say that the next day and the day after that and the day after that, like it, it just seems to only progress. But it's definitely increasing risk, right? I mean, you know, organizations are scrambling to solve business challenges. How do we continue to operate? Um, you know, as I've harped on remote access uh, quite a bit during this uh, session. That was a big one, right? You have a lot of companies enabling remote access to facilitate that at home work. And you know, if it's not configured appropriately, if it's not properly secured, that's that nail that's sticking out above the surface. And now you're just playing you know, roulette uh, of, is someone going to target you in attempts to get into the network? So, so that's been a big one. And we've been, we we do full port scans of all of our policyholders once a week. So if you have RDP turned open, you're getting an email from us telling you why you should not do that. Um, but, uh, but that's a big one. I think the other one is just behavioral changes. I mean, you'd mentioned the whole scammers taking advantage of the fact that, hey, there's all these GDPR notices going out. Same things happening with COVID, um, particularly around wire uh, transfers. So we have a lot of, you know, we see a lot of BECs business email compromises where the actor impersonating that organization sends off an email and says, hey, due to COVID-19, we're no longer accepting checks. Um, here's our new wiring instructions. Mm -hmm. And the person on the other end is like, this seems totally normal. Of course, you know, they're not accepting checks. No one's in the office to accept them. And they just blindly send the payment to the new ACH instruction, which is controlled by the hacker. Um, There's a not-for-profit in Florida that we insured where that happened one and a half million dollar loss. Um, fortunately, in this particular case, we were able to work with them to recover the funds. We recovered everything by five hundred dollars, and we made a donation to them for, for the for that extra five hundred. But you know, not everyone is so uh, is so successful. And I'm telling you, like we see so many claims at this scale that it's the same thing. Like there's dozens of organizations where it's identical messaging. Um, due to COVID nineteen, we're no longer accepting checks. So. You know, you got to be, you have to be conscious of these uh, behavioral changes in your organization that people might take wind of. The other is even switching services. So we've seen threat groups, for example, if you're transitioning to 365 or from 365 to G Suite or, or vice versa, they can actually see that this change has been made because there are DNS changes. And they're pouncing on that to then send targeted phishing emails. Um, that look like setup emails that look like, you know, welcome to the new service emails, which are, you know, in, in some respects, like spear phishing campaigns, 
but they're done entirely opportunistically to companies that have just made a DNS change from one service to another. Mm-hmm. And so you just have to be aware of, of some of this, of some of the techniques and, and you know, what, what we would call TTPs, tools, tactics, and procedures that these threat actors are using. It's, they're creative. I will tell you that they're very creative. Yeah. The, um, you know, with that change, I, I don't think a, a lot of organizations really, they didn't prepare for this, right? Clearly uh, no one did. Um, but yeah. with this change in dynamic and work culture, a lot of organizations are struggling and with remote learning and everything. We see it, right? This is, this is what we specialize in is communicating with people. And um, we found that a lot of the organizations, because it's remote, it's a lot harder to communicate about certain things. One of them that um, we simulated was the, the whole concept of this stimulus check, right? It's a, it's a touchy subject but it's an important subject because this is what the bad guys were using to, you know, flavor the week to convince people to click on things. And that's all it takes. They don't play by any rules. And uh, uh, we got some friendly calls from another three letter friend of ours an ally of ours to uh, basically stop what we're doing to educate people. And I get it, right? I I, I get it that it's annoying the three letter agency, but on the other end, people are using this as a way to communicate, right? They're using these tools to establish, hey, you know what, um, this is super important. Thank, thank goodness we trained for a, in a scenario like this because uh, imagine this happened at home and you just had your entire bank account uh, and your, the money in it taken away from you by a bad guy. Right. This is why we practice and practice and learn from things like that because it's, it's important, right? People's lives depend on this stuff. And what we're talking about here, right? Uh, And the attendees of the webinar, this stuff is important, right? The role you play and the reason we're talking about all this is to kind of prepare and practice and learn from this type of stuff. It's not to point the finger at people or say, I I don't have a budget, so we're not gonna do it. It's that ultimately it's bringing this stuff up with your management team, with the executives, with everyone involved in your company to to, to bring awareness to this type of situation. So, so with that, um, and I, I know we're closing up on time here, what other ways, I guess, can the, the IT managers, security teams, everyone involved help communicate this type of stuff with their uh, executive management and, and other managers in the company about what we're talking about? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, it comes down to data. It's that dollars and cents. It's how do, how do you present things in that terminology? And to be honest, that's something that is really difficult for an IT person to do. I mean, you know, we know that certain things are important, but sometimes, you know, I know it's important is not enough of a justification for a business owner or an executive, right? They want to see like the hard, the hard numbers. And, and that's where, you know, we, I, I'm, I'm going to, you know, shameless plug, um, but it's free. Like we, we have this risk assessment and, you know, curricula is of course promoted within it. Um, you're one of our partners. We provide your service to our customers, but we provide this free risk assessment um, that's tailored for companies. And it has these dollars and cents. It will actually tell you where you rank relative to uh, your peers, to the global average of our policyholders. It'll estimate the cost of, of things. Um, and so you can have like a real dollars and cents conversation as to what the risk is, at which point I think it's easier to justify certain investments that are being made. Um, you know, we're also able to again share data to suggest that, hey, things like MFA, we're a huge advocate of that. And so we think of ourselves as, as allies to the IT uh, folks that, that we work with. Like we are giving them access to our cybersecurity platform. We're giving them this claims data. We're giving them these tools um, that they can then use to, to help justify decisions or to help uh, you know, better uh, align their investment. Or in some cases, we're doing things that they were paying for. So it's like you can use our services and now you've freed up your budget to go do, thing, to go do other things. So I think, um, I think the best way to do it is to try and talk about it, first of all, as a risk management problem. That's step number one. Uh, the technical stuff, executives are gonna drone out. They can think about it from a risk management perspective. If you can tell them, hey, across the market, 6% of companies have a claim and when they have it, it costs this much money. That's a whole different frame of reference to have that conversation. Yeah. Well, it's uh, not an easy battle, as, as no. we uh, clearly know. You know, it being in this field is uh, uh, a difficult field to be in. But using Absolutely. data, using data to our advantage, using our community, 
learning from each other, learning from ourselves about events and practicing, I think cannot advocate that enough. Um, that's all I got for today. I want to thank you, Joshua, for, you know, just walking us through kind of your experience and advice and uh, things that you guys have learned and shared. Anything else that you wanted to share before we wrap up here? No, it's, it's been my pleasure. Um, thank you for having me. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for joining. Um, like Joshua mentioned, we're also partnered with coalitions. So as part of those free tools and services, uh, you actually get a free account with curricula of our security awareness training and phishing platform and online learning and all that fun stuff with all the characters and things that you see in my background here and his background. So I'd uh, love to have you learn more about us at getcurricula.com. You can also visit, is it coalition.com? Coalitioninc.com, yes, Coalition. I-N-C. Coalitioninc.com, you can go through your insurance broker to learn more about them or check out their website or, or do both. Um, thanks again, Joshua, for having us here. It's been a great talk and we will talk to yeah. everyone later. Thank you. My pleasure, yeah, be well, take care.